Hey guys, welcome to Mouths of the Merrimack. I'm Captain Chris here with Andy O'Daddy. And it, it feels like the the summer's right around the corner. We're getting some warm weather this week, and man, I'm getting excited. It does, and uh, football season officially ended, so. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so now, now I really have nothing to do. <laughs> so Saturdays and Sundays are going to be really, really getting the gear, getting the boat ready. Yep, definitely. Um, uh, obviously organizing all my tackle down in the basement right now, building rods, getting rigs well, all set up. That's building rods. Like, it's rod building season, you know. Finally, like, got the itch to start wrapping again and uh, finished up a finished up a trolling rod and uh, working on a jigging rod. So, yeah. And I didn't want to touch any of these things, like, three months ago. I was like, ah, another one, another one. Now it's time to make them. Well, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We know what's coming. I mean, yeah. Christ, two weeks from now, uh, two months from now, we'll be uh, haddock fishing. Yep, exactly. Trout Looking fishing right it. around the corner. Can't wait. Oh, yeah. And our guest tonight is somebody who just doesn't stop fishing. The guy is an absolute animal. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, you guys might have seen him on a, writing as an author on On the Water. Uh, seen him on some other podcasts. He's part of the Hobie Kayak team. He's part of the Hoagie Lore team. And great fisherman. I'm really excited to learn a lot from him tonight. We have Mr. Eric Harrison. How are you doing tonight, Eric? Great. I'm, I, too, am excited about the upcoming fishing season. You know, I, I do fish all year long, but, man, I really like it when it's warmer out. Yeah, you, yeah. Got, that, you got that right. Are you, you know, uh, I was fishing this weekend, and it was, uh, it was like 30 degrees and, and uh, about a 10-mile-per-hour breeze. And, and if the fishing wasn't so good, I wouldn't have stayed so long. Now, what are you fishing so, for? Are you, are you ice fishing, or are you out there in your kayak somewhere? I was out in my kayak. You know, that's, oh. that's, I, I live the Hopi lifestyle. I have my kayak on the other day when it was like minus 10 degrees around here, I went to the hardware store and some guy was honking his horn at me and pointing to my, the kayak on my roof and, and laughing at me thinking that, you know, I was driving around with this kayak on my roof and he's probably right because I hadn't been out for like three days. So, <laughs> so do you just keep the kayak on the roof all the time? Like you're just ready to oh, go? Oh yeah. And- yeah, it's it's there. It's always ready to go. I'm, you know, that's awesome. the great thing about kayak fishing is that you're always always ready. Definitely, yeah. So obviously you have a Hobie because you're on the Hobie team. Uh, yeah. How, how much have you decked that bad boy out? You know what? I am not like a big rigging guy. Like what my idea is, just keep it really simple, and like I treat the kayak as having a little cockpit to fish from. So I got my fish finder. I've got the ability to put on a rod holder should I need it, but I don't really do that much. And I got some tackle behind me and, and I, you know, some rod holders. So I'm out there with however many rods I need. And just like I do pretty much mostly cast, you know, lures and um, not much bait. If I, if I do fish bait, you know, I might stick a rod holder on the kayak, but yeah, it's really like when, unrigged. When, yeah, when you said no rod holder, I'm like, oh, he's definitely not a live bait, bait guy. He must not be. <laughs> on a typical trip, well, the other thing is, is oh, go ahead. When Sorry. when you're uh, when you're pedaling a Hobie, like you're pedaling, so you're hand, you're doing this hands free thing. So like you don't really need a rod holder. I mean, even if I'm trolling, I'm still just holding the rod. Um, you know, you just toss it back, hold onto the rod, and pedal around looking for looking for fish looking for spots and you know when you're in a kayak you're always going at trolling speed so you know you basically troll from spot to spot and then you you go and pound a spot for a little while and and then move on so and and you were asking how many rods i i bring yeah so i bring a a milk crate and i'll typically bring two to four rods it just depends on like how many different species i want to catch um if I'm really just targeting like one species, like if I'm going for stripers, it, it also depends where I'm going. Like in the summertime, I'll bring four rods and each one will be rigged up slightly differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I'll be one will have the 13 inch uh, jig and hoagie with a, a half ounce head. And then one sitting next to it will be a 13 inch jig and hoagie with a th- three quarter ounce head. Yeah, and then I have one uh, fourteen-inch rigged weightless. So you know, it's just like if I'm going in an area where like there's a drop off or something like that, I just switch rods really quick. Boom! I I got the right weight, no retying, no nothing, and switch right back. Yeah, that's kind of like how I 
kind of picture my rods out too a little bit when I'm on my charters, especially when I'm throwing a lot of lures early in the season for stripers. Like I'll have, you know, we'll fish our, our rubber. You know, I'll have a set with a half ounce head and then a set with like an ounce head. You know, if we start moving into that dip, deeper water, we'll swap, we'll swap over. Or some days I'll, I'll have a set of four unrigged, uh, unweighted, and then have a set of four with that ounce head. And kind of depending as we bounce around the river into different spots, uh, fish it uh, different ways, you know, for the situations. Again, so we don't have to swap it out. So especially like on a kayak, it must be tough because it, it, it's probably harder to change out a lure and tie a knot than it is to just grab another rod that's in your milk crate ready to go. Exactly. It's just easier to just swap rods and, and just go. I, I think the advantage you have on a boat is that, you know, you can you can have a guy casting with the weightless and a guy casting with the weighted at the same time to, to get that pattern down quicker. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I like to team up with a buddy and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work an area together and then it's like, you getting bit, what are you getting bit on? Weightless weighted. And you know, there's, there's a lot of times where just using a quarter ounce difference makes, makes a big, uh, a, a big difference in your presentation and, and the number of fish you catch. You know, the, the basic principle is to always use the lightest jig that will keep you in the strike zone. You know, if you're fishing really deep water, that might be six ounces. But if you're fishing shallow water, the difference between like a half ounce and, and uh, three quarter ounces, it can be pretty big. What's the earliest you ever had to go for striper fishing, like casting and jigging wise? Um, I generally won't go over an ounce. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use an ounce and 20 feet on windy days. Yeah. And the wind in the kayak is really what makes you bump up the weight. Cause I just, I don't fish deep water much. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty much always in under 20 feet and you know, my, my normal zone is say five to 15 feet. And so you, you just don't need a lot of weight unless there's, you know, some other condition, which would be current or wind. So you always have to account for that in your retrieve and in your presentation and there's a lot of areas around Boston that I fish that, man, you go out there and, and you're on the slack tide and you break out the weightless and you're fishing that. And then the next thing you know, that current starts rolling and it's just pushing your weightless right up to the top. And the fish have, you know, as the current's gone up, the fish have moved down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And now you got to bump up to your jig head size, get it down and, and really just bottom crawl it. So you, you got to you know, do that reactive fishing where you're just constantly switching to get in the right spot with the right bait. Now you mentioned you fish, you try to fish with a partner boat or a partner kayak a lot of the times, and it cuts down that learning curve or that pattern finding out absolutely tremendously. And, um, and we try to do the same thing on the boats with our little small network and stuff. Um, do you guys, is it like there are a lot of times you just go out there and we see a lot of the boaters that are out there every day as a kayak guy. Um, are you guys kind of making plans, talking about uh, loose areas where you're going to fish and try out? Because you don't have that ability to just go and plan out 30 miles an hour to go where you want to go. So, you know, it doesn't help if you're on a kayak and somebody three miles away is hammering fish, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you have to make the spots you go to work. And that's that's one of the things about kayak fishing is you you know you can haul out you can drive drive somewhere or you know for me going three miles isn't that big of a deal but you know it, it can be a haul especially if if there's some limitations on time for your trip but you know it, it's like you do have to plan plan your area and I, I'll pick an area where I can fish you know uh, some some really prime spots and I can go from spot to spot. And, and a, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that it's not that there are no fish here. It's that there are no fish in the exact spot I'm fishing. And if I move myself a quarter of a mile, a half a mile away, and I get on the adjacent structure that they hang on during that stage of the tide, I can find those fish again. And it really does force you to f do a better job of fish finding. Because those fish are not typically not going long distances. Um, there, there are times when they just clear out of the, the inshore waters. We had a lot of that this summer, uh, especially once the water temperatures cranked up. But inshore, those fish are moving, you know, shallow, deep. They're moving in and out with the tide. They're moving in into the high current, low current zones. 
and there's so many places that you can find where you know you you can fish some deep water and then as the tide comes up the fish may push up onto a flat or into some shallower area and you can just follow those fish as they go so you know if you go to that flat and shallow area first there's no fish there mm -hmm. but then you you come back in with with the tide and all of a sudden the fish are there so it's really about just prospecting and, and that's also why it, it helps to have you know a, a friend on the water with you you know we'll we'll go a hundred yards apart and we'll cruise along and we'll we'll side scan and we'll scope out some areas and and take some casts and try some different things and then once we start finding the fish it's it's kind of like you, you just have to start getting a pattern as to which direction they're headed because they stripers really move a lot yeah, they do. And like you said, they're not really moving so much farther away, but they might tuck away to an, an adjacent structure, whether it's a bottom change, whether it's a drop off. Um, you know, and I think as fishermen, particularly people who are just starting out or don't get there out a lot, a lot of times they're fishing spots that they hear about, that they read about, but they're not really taking the time to think about when those fish would be there, what makes sense, how they would orient themselves to the prime feeding habitats. For example, up here, we have Joppa Flats. You know, you might hear people say, oh, I was killing them on the flats today. Well, for, for me, there's like eight different characteristics that qualify as Joppa Flats. You know, are they, are they on the edge? Are they on that little muscle bed by the dike? Are they in the mud in the grass? You know, are they in the mooring field? So, and how do they move on different stages of the tide on those flats alone? is just what really is going to help you maximize your time out in the water the more you understand that. And I, I couldn't agree with you more there. Yeah, and, it, you know, every spot is like that. There's, you know, when you say Joppa Flats, you're talking about an area of, you know, five to ten square miles. You know, if, if, you, if you just, like, imagine that area in your mind and if, if you talk to the locals, like – their definition of Joppa Flats is probably 30 square miles because they, they add in a lot more because they, they want to make things as as less specific as they can. Yeah. And it's it's really about being able to just dial into certain areas. And I think side scan has really totally changed the game on, on stuff like that because you can see uh, structural elements that you never could before. You know, I, I run, run a hummingbird and... It's like mega imaging just provides you with, with such great pictures. Um, just being able to see, like you said, muscle beds, like you can see the difference. You can see exactly where it starts. You can see where it ends. You can see all the different kind of aspects of the structure that you're fishing. And, you know, you know, when you're off the fish, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's a, a matter of, getting on the fish and then staying with them. The other thing is that, that stripers are pretty spooky. Uh, one thing you really see on the side scan is that stripers don't sit around, especially if you sit on top of them and you cast over them all the time. You know, just one little kayak casting at them, you can see on the side scan, you can see like the fish fanning out away from your boat. And yeah. when I fish areas with, with a lot of boats in it, you know, I tend to fish a little ways away from the boats because I see how they react to the boats and they're typically the boats pull right up in them and those fish will just kind of scoot along. If you'll get caught, they'll scoot along and circle around and they may even be just doing a circle where they just keep going back through the field where the boats are. And, yep. but if you can just kind of break away from them, you can get away from the boats. You can get into a little bit less disturbed water and, and maybe hit them on more of their cycle of, of swimming through the area. It's kind of that old adage that there's 50 fish around and, and 25 boats, that's two fish per boat. But if there's 40 fish around in one boat, there's 40 fish per one boat. You that's know, right. your chances for really maximizing that bite when they do swing around is, um, is really an important part. And I, I agree with you, especially in a, in a shallow water situation, kind of staying away from the crowd. You know, they'll they'll push towards you at some point. Yep. Yeah, sometimes it's a matter of, of knowing which direction they're headed down the beach and just getting ahead of them and being willing to just kind of slowly drift and slowly just kind of work your way into them. And 
kind of creep up on them and catch catch a fish or two and then spin around and try to do it again. Mm -hmm. And um, I also noticed that too, like when I'm trolling bait, I, we troll a lot of live mackerel if I have some or pogies. When we're trolling mackerel, you'll you'll see on the a track line, you know, we'll be on a contour line down the beach. You catch a couple of fish in the school. You see the circle happen about twice, and then you keep going about another 50 yards. You see it again, and then another 50 yards, and they're just kind of riding that contour line down the beach a little bit. Yep. I mean, we love our Navionics maps, and and it's like once you kind of figure out which line those fish are on, you can just kind of stick down those lines and and just kind of work them and and you know you you, you see them there for for a half hour and then uh, then they all disappear and then you move 300 yards down the beach and they're in on, on the approximate same line 100 yards down the beach so when you're looking at your chart you mentioned the chart and I can dork out about this all day um, what are you looking for when you're just like you're planning a trip or you're out in the water, what kind of features of your Navionics chart or do you have the um was it the Coastmaster, the hummingbird one? No, I, I have the, the Navionics. Yeah. And, uh, they're very similar. They're very similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I like the, the sonar charts. They really you know, they have they have that detail in there and you can see the humps and bumps. And you know, I, I'm really looking for something that's gonna push that current up. Like right. that little hump. Um, I'm looking for areas where there's going to be a little bit different water flow. And, you know, some of it is the charts and some of it is, is experience on the water where, mm -hmm. you know, you, you get in an area and you start to notice, not only do I see this on the chart, but when I look at the water, especially when you, you get out there on those calm days with no wind, you can actually see the current line and you're mm -hmm. like, okay, so at this stage of the tide, the current line is pouring over this part of the flat and you notice that's where the fish are hanging yeah right in those seams like that rough water next to the flat water is type of thing you're looking for yep and there's certain rips where you just like you know where they're going to be in those those rips and and uh when you when you go back and you look at the map you can see like there's there's a break and may there might be a little uh a little hole there and it's, mm -hmm. it might not even be very big. It might just be like three feet uh, deeper than, than the surrounding water. But that's creating a little eddy in, in there, or at least an eddy on the bottom. And those fish are just hanging right on that. So, you know, you, you got to look for, for the changes. You know, the channels are, are pretty easy to spot. And, you know, a lot of times it's, okay, at, at low tide, the fish are backing off to the channels. At high tide, they're exiting the channels and coming up onto the flats. And there's so many spots in New England that, and, and when I say flats, it's like a, you know, everybody thinks of, of sand flats in Florida. It's not what I'm talking about. You know, in, in, in this area, like a flat may be just a boulder field. Mm -hmm. And it might be a boulder field that's, that's surrounded by deeper water. And those, those fish are going to come up, especially at night, grubbing for, for lobsters in it. I, I like fishing for bass that are grubbing for lobsters. There's just something really fun about about them. You know, it's it's usually a a big plastic on the jig bite, and those fish are working. Um, they can really like they can really be focused in on what they're doing, and you really have to just kind of finesse them and and work that bait just in the strike zone, keeping it within like three feet of the bottom, ticking bottom, that lift up of the rod and that swing back down where you just you feel it gently tap the bottom. And you give it just the slightest little movement, and you're on. And it's just like those fish are just really focused when they're when they're doing lobsters and crabs. And that's it's also that's really cool like pretty big too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And and this summer, you know, we had a lot of fish on on pogies, and that pulled a lot of fish out of the areas that I fish. You know, a lot of people were like, "Oh, this is such a great year," and I was like, "You know, I I don't want to go out and chase." bass on on big baits and you know if the opportunity strikes when i'm out i'm i might do it i always have some some circles hooks with me but i'm just it's just not really my cup of tea i'll, I'll do it if i'm not catching anything but i i really appreciate the challenge of of getting them on the artificial 
and it just like a lot of my opportunities disappeared over the last summer, you know, because those fish were staying offshore. They weren't coming into their usual haunts. And, you know, if, if I had just gone out a, a couple of miles and, and been able to fish during the day, you know, a lot of the, the good striper fishing last summer was during the daytime. And, and a lot of the opportunities I had to fish last summer were at night. So that didn't coincide too well. Yeah, talking to some of the guys that night fish hard up here, um, this year we didn't have as big of a pogey bite. Actually, this year and last year, our pogey bite kind of slowed down significantly from previous years. Um, we just weren't getting them in the numbers that we had been getting. And um, it seems like the night guys around here started doing a lot better. And it's always kind of that inverse relationship. The more pogies there are out in the ocean, um, it seems that those night guys that are fishing inside in the rivers – uh, aren't doing as well as they normally do, you know, and that makes sense. That's follow that bait. They're eating all day. They're getting full, you know, they're probably not coming in at night. And and not just that, they're getting full with really high quality food, mm -hmm. you know, so they, they don't, they don't need to chase after that lower value food. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure if stripers had their preference, they'd be eating pogies over crabs every day. <laughs> but they do seem to have a fondness for those um, silver dollar size crabs, yeah, and uh, and and also lobsters. I mean, I can't tell you how ma how much lobster junk I've had puked out in my kayak. Oh, I can imagine. Now those, so you must have a lot of rock piles out in the ocean side. Oh, I never really, I don't think I've ever fished Boston Harbor, so mo we don't really have a lot of rock piles anywhere within like, mm, eh, other than our jetties probably within eight or nine miles each way of the mouth of the river. So you don't see a lot of guys rock hopping and stuff like that during the day. Some of the night guys will off the beach. There's a few spots uh, where they'll go and have success. Uh, but during the daytime, it's it's not as prevalent as it seems to be down, like even just down in Gloucester or off of Cape Ann, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to coming on the sandy beaches of the Merrimack. Yeah, sandy beaches are, are kind of a different a different animal than the uh, than the rocky areas, and some of the spots I fish offer both rocky areas and kind of sandy, and it's it's always interesting to to see like the difference in how the fish are behaving in, in those scenarios. Um, sandy beaches, I've found that they'll they'll often go up super shallow, and mm -hmm. they just seem to just not be relating to anything at all. It's insane, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's just like the, you just you have to s scope them out and search, and you know you, you find fish um, typically in that that five to ten foot range. But then you'll go up and closer and closer, and you'll you'll be looking and you say, ah, these are all small fish, and you'll be in the the sixteen to twenty inch fish, and then all of a sudden you look and you're like, those are not sixteen to twenty inch fish, and that is a big school of fish, and now you're in three feet of water. And cast them towards shore, and that that happens a lot. Is that you find that big school of big fish, and you know one of the things is I I think those fish are probably just in there resting, like they're not in there actively feeding, they're mm -hmm. up in there because it's safe. There's no seals cruising in the beaches. There's there's no great whites cruising in three feet of water there. Ooh, you know maybe if I we went know. down off of Monomoy they would be, but uh, let's knock Christmas on wood that they're not coming up here yet. <laughs> A few years ago, we were fishing real tight to the beach. We were trolling pogies in like three to five feet of water. You had to be inside the curl of the wave. If you weren't inside the curl, you weren't getting hit, right? So we, yeah. we come out, we get on the beach, and we're dragging a pogey. We catch a striper, fighting the striper for a minute, about 10 feet from the boat, like a 12-foot great white oh, no. just came out of nowhere. Everyone was like, Wah! there's people swimming on the beach at 6.30 in the morning. One of them's a friend of mine, a uh, woman I work with, husband. I call him up. I'm like, dude, you got to get off the beach. I can see you. There's a great white kicking around. But you're you're right. I, I totally agree with you with that that concept that they're in there and they're just kind of sunning. I don't know what they're doing, but they're just relaxing. Like you said, it's safe. Um, and it seems like almost every year to year and day to and uh, week to week, sometimes they're really in that two to six foot range. And they'll be in there, and then two weeks later, they'll all shift out and be in, like, 35 feet, or they'll be in 18 yep. feet. 
and it's and they do seem to kind of stay in a certain depth for a little bit of an area or to at least a tide change or a wind change I find to be kind of a thing that sets them off about how deep they're going. And, um, yeah, it almost seems like there's no rhyme or reason. We have a lot of sandbars, a lot of little holes and points, some rip currents. I mean, we still get even a mile down the island, we'll get tide lines from the river pushing fresh water. And, uh, but everyone always talks about, like, what's holding them here? One year it was squid. One year there was squid inside that we don't really see that often. Yeah, I think there's a lot of variables that go into keeping them tight to the beach, though, because it could be wind direction, like east wind pushing out, colder water, but it's warmer water towards the, towards the beach. you know. And then, like Eric was saying, they feel protected in there. There's probably a ton, ton of sand eels, I would assume. Yep. Yeah, yeah, a ton of sand eels. Everywhere, and they're chasing yeah. those around. Um, but, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's reason. But it's, I don't know. The reasons are many. It could be many. I feel like every day. Right, so that's what I we think. We don't live down there with them. You know? so. <laughs> <laughs> but that that idea about the water temperature, you know, there there are times when you can go in shore and, and you can go up in five, three feet of water and you notice a temperature break. It's either warmer or colder. And it, it might be a degree. It might be two degrees. But those create like little thermal zones that they want to be in when the water's too warm they they want to go into that that perfectly temperatured water that's a little bit cooler and and when we get these down here when we get the east winds um or I'm, when we get the southwesters blowing that blows all the surface water offshore and uh the harbor temperatures will just plummet i mean mm-hmm. i i've fished in 48 degree water in in Boston in August. And if we just get three days in a row of strong winds, just pushing that surface water offshore, it just totally turns the water over and it really, really drops fast. And that's when weird stuff happens. That's when you find big schools of big fish right up in two feet of water. Mm -hmm. And they're probably in two feet of water because the sun was shining on those rocks during the day. And those rocks are the warmest thing, and now the tide's coming in over those warmer rocks, and that water is probably like a half a degree warmer than than everything else, and they're just sitting in it. And I think there's a lot of other stuff we don't understand about the plankton, about all the the little microbial life out there. Um, it's it's setting up food chains, it's setting up places for um, squid to come in, setting up places for sand eel or or other bait fish to, to come in and hang out. And, you know, the, the bass don't have a PhD in science, but they, they know a lot more than, than PhDs. <laughs> they, they live this every day, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's just like, it's always like for me, like what is that one factor today that's, that's changing the bite up or keeping it going? You know, you get that bite going for three days when you think you got it all figured out. Then on the fourth day, there's that, one little change now is it a water tide a water temp thing is it a, a tide you know being pushed later in the day are they relating different that wind shift a moon is a big one around here you know and just that that pattern that just keeps recycling itself over and over in different ways that's what keeps me going with this that's what i love well plus is the whole migratory aspect of it too they haven't really got where they're going yet either right yeah daily migration uh seasonal migrations you know all factors that go into play yeah you know and there's there's i i think you know once the fish set up there a lot of them are staying locally but they're doing their local migrations where they have they have their food runs you know, mm-hmm. they, they know where the different feeding opportunities are. And they're going out, they're checking one thing out, they're coming back in shore, checking out another thing. You know, they, they're they pretty well versed on where they can feed. And they, they definitely seem to have, like, pattern-related preferences for certain kind of feeding. And like you were saying, you know, they're, what, what I like to have is, like, steady conditions day after day. Absolutely. I think steady conditions lead to a much more consistent bite. But we always get that, you know, this New England, we always get that major change in conditions where, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's the same temperature every day for five days in a row. And then all of a sudden the wind shifts, it's pouring rain, everything's different. And 
now your your bite is gone. And you know, in the winter time, like people get all jacked up. They're like, "Oh, tomorrow's going to be sixty degrees, and it's going to be a great day to go out fishing." Well, it's going to be a great day to go out fishing, but you know that that sixty degree day is is a big change in the pattern. And although you think that it's it's going to jack up the fish, it's not going to have a giant impact on water temperature, but it is going to have some impact on the water temperature. And those fish that have been settled into a zone, they're going to move out of that zone. So if I've been on the bite on those fish for, you know, four, four 35 degree days in a row, and now it's, it's going to be 60 tomorrow, that school of fish is gone. Exactly. And, it changes up your pattern yeah. that you had on them now. Yep. So it doesn't necessarily make it better or worse. It just makes it it's different. different. You got to find it nicer again. to go out when it's 60 for you. But for them, that that's a big adjustment. Their their whole biology changes. Yep. Music. Yeah. <laughs> no, and no, just, you, uh, you know, you're talking about the migration of it all. Yeah. Um, like I do, I do a fair amount of freshwater fishing too, just as kind of my local, I call them jog fishes, where I'll go out and fish for an hour in the morning before work. And yeah, I have a lot of freshwater you know, close by that I can just hit and, you know, it takes me 10, 15 minutes to get somewhere and launch a kayak, fish for an hour and, and get back home. And you can really follow those seasonal cycles. Um, freshwater fish, they, they don't migrate like saltwater fish do, but they migrate within the lake, within river systems. They go from spot to spot and they really change their habits through the seasons. I mean, you just look at freshwater bass fishermen and Freshwater bass fishermen are really good at adapting to change. Mm -hmm. And if you look at kind of the lure categories that, that they like to use, there are times where they want to go with a jig, times that they want to go with a, a crankbait. This time of year, a lot of guys are using stuff like uh, vibration baits, blade baits, and rattle traps. And all those kind of those principles, they apply to like other types of fish as well. In that that responses change through the season, and that's one thing about targeting striped bass year round is that I really see like the ways that they respond um, through the season is is very different. Um, I will rarely get an amped up fish in the winter time. Winter time is is all about the finesse, and you know those those dog days of summer when the bite gets really tough. That's also all about the finesse. So it's like those same tactics that you use in the dead of winter can can get you out of out of being skunked in the summertime. Do you find a lot of um, translation between how freshwater fish behave, like in specifics, uh, as it correlates to saltwater fish, like on certain maybe like wind changes or pressure drops? Do they do they both like go into deeper or shallower water? Are they going for different water temps? Do you notice any correlation between all of them? So like there's like this category of like fish just act like fish or is it more species dependent between saltwater and freshwater? I, I really think it's, it's fish that act, act like fish and, you know, and, and yeah, weather, weather affects it. But I, I think the, um, the real thing that impacts fishing is there's a bite cycle that exists in the universe. Right. And this is this is a universal thing um, in that, like, if you look at the salooner tables, mm -hmm. those salooner tables, they're not exactly right, but they're also not wrong. They give you the general principles of what is going on right now. And fish do follow cyclical patterns of feeding. They follow cyclical patterns of feeding through the day, through the week, through the month, around moon phases. Um Freshwater fish are not impacted by tides, mm -hmm. but the salooner tables are based on basically tides. You know, if you line up your tide chart and your salooner tables, you're going to see, and those salooner tables work in freshwater too. Those okay. freshwater bites happen just the same way that you do in salt. You're sitting on the fish, you're not catching anything, and then all of a sudden the bite is going off and it goes off for an hour and a half. And then you you look at your buddy and you say, when was the last time you had a hit? It's like, I haven't had a, a hit for 10 minutes. And the fish are still there, but the bite's off. And that's the exact same thing, whether it's, you know, white perch or crappies or, or largemouth bass or stripers. Yeah. 
know, it's, it's that same pattern. Those solar lunar tables are things that not a lot of people talk about, and the ones who know swear by them. For the people that are listening that might not know what a solar lunar, ta- solar lunar table is measuring, and do you think you can get into a little detail on that and let them know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really just a uh, it, it's just a, a chart of uh, predicted bite times, and but it is based on on the you know the the impact of the the sun and the the moon, mostly the moon, and really, I, I'm serious when I say if you, if you line that up with your tide charts, you will see that the peak bites come just like in in salt water like generally before and after a tide change. Mm-hmm. And there, there's a reason for that. I mean, it's, it's like animals in nature have, they're very tied into their evolution. And, you know, there, there was a lot of current that used to run on tides. And, and I'm sure um, even like the, the genesis of the freshwater fish dealt with um tides and currents and and you know it's it's just kind of innate in it's in their dna and Mm -hmm. um so you know it's definitely worth like if you're not familiar with them i would not fish by them you know but they're they're information for you to use and they're they're a great excuse it's like, oh, I went fishing and I got skunked, and it was because you know it was slack tide, the wind was blowing, and the lunar table was looked was like, all wrong. Looked like shit. But if you say it, if you, if you say that to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna nod my head and I'm gonna say this guy doesn't know how to fish. <laughs> well, that's what it is. You got to make those adjustments. It is exactly. It is, it is funny too because it's not something like I because I you know guys that go out there just pretty much anytime you can. I'm out there every day, so. Um, you know, we, I kind of get the idea of what's falling, but sometimes like I'll look back on my season and been like, man, that was a great day. And that was a great day. And I'll look at the lunar tables and like, yeah. those are the ones that show like the three out of three fish. Like it's going to be a good day. And it, they nail it like all the time, quite often, yes. quite often. And every day all... has a rating. Yeah. And, right. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's true that like every single day, someone Someone in the U.S. catches a personal best, right? Mm-hmm. Someone in the U.S. goes out and has great fishing, but that's just that's just the randomness of statistics, right? Correct. So, you know, these events happen and they happen occasionally, and you're going to get you're going to catch a personal best at a time when you least expect it. Mm-hmm. But odds are that most personal bests are going to occur within certain windows. It doesn't mean that that it's 90% of them. It may mean that like 52% occur within, you know, the prime windows. Yeah. You know, it's just that it's, it's more. And, and that's the interesting thing about the lunar tables. It's, it's a probability thing. You know, the probability mm-hmm. of, of uh, finding a good bite is, is probably better on most of those days. And I can tell you that I've been out, you know, quite a few days where I looked and it was, it was the right day. But I didn't do that well. And, you know, maybe it was just I sucked at fishing that day. It was probably that I just didn't make the right decisions on mm-hmm. where to fish. Yeah, and that's what it comes down to. Like, every day is just like a, a concoction of the decisions that you make. And, yep. you know, you try to just do the best that you can with the information that you have, the, the things that you, the knowledge that you know, your experience. What all the tides are telling you, what your buddies are telling you, and you're trying to make that choice. And, you know, sometimes you're going to be wrong. That's how it goes. Yeah. And you take that as a learning experience as well. Yeah, yeah you they... know, um, carp around here in the wintertime, they get in these giant schools. And they can be kind of easy to find. On All you need is a, a kayak and a fish finder. and But getting them to bite, it's a whole nother story. And... They are one that, like carp, if you fish for them on those lunar table days where it says that, you know, today is a, an 80% day or a 90% day, those are the days you're much more likely to, to have that day where you catch a dozen of them. And you look at these schools of, of fish that you see on the, the sonar and you, you drop down some corn on them and you say, oh, I'm going to catch a million fish. And no response. 
nothing. And then you go back the next day, and it's just bam. You know, it's, it's lights out. And who knows what, what makes them tick. But they're, every fish has something that, that makes it tick in there. And uh, carp can be one of the most challenging fish because they really have a, a way of turning themselves off. Just switching off that bite. Yeah. Dan, you want to go carp fishing this week? Yeah, that this sounds weekend? like I've never caught a carp. <laughs> <laughs> we got to bend a rod, Eric. We're not yeah, like you. We, we don't have a kayak on the top of our, our trucks everywhere we go. I'm going out of my mind right now. <laughs> well, you know, like when you're going out of your mind in the wintertime, um, my go-to, um, I'm going to go take a walk, is I'm going to find a, a place where I can cast into, say, um, 15 feet or more of water and I'm going to take a drop shot rig with a tiny bait, maybe a two inch plastic on there mm -hmm. and a, an ultralight with um, five pound braid and zing this drop shot rig around. And I'm going to go out and catch some yellow perch, some white perch, some crappies, whatever it is that, that I can find out there. But that's like, I just, I have to get a bite. And, and that's my go-to. I just want to go out and spend an hour and just poke around and catch a fish. And I have a few different spots that I, I know I can go to, and I'll almost never get skunked in those spots. So it's, it's you know, that, that little, I got to get a tug. You got me all amped up. <laughs> I'm going to try to figure it out. I want to go back to what you were talking about with the micro stuff because the last few years, like just following you on your social media accounts, um, you've been really scaling down tackle and going after real small fish, both yeah. in salt water and fresh water. And it's, I remember talking to Jay Shields about it a couple of years ago, and we just thought that was the coolest thing in the world because anybody can go out and target big fish. Right. But can you go out and catch a really small fish or a really small species very, very well. Yeah. That, you know, my, my joke is that anybody, anybody can catch a big fish, but uh, it takes good fishermen to feel the little bites. <laughs> and, and, you know, I just like, I like going fishing and I, I know a lot of fishermen that, that they just want to catch big fish and, and that's fine. You know, it's like if you just like if you're if your minimum size on a fish is going to be a, a 25 inch striper and you, everything has to be bigger than that, you know, you're going to limit your fishing opportunities. Mm -hmm. And and there's there's more than one part of fishing I like. Um, I love the challenge of catching the fish. But another part of the fishing that I like is I love seeing what I catch. Yeah. And I also like I like the mystery of not knowing what I'm going to catch. Like I like going jigging on the North Shore. I like finding pods of fish roaming open water and fresh water and just sampling them. So let's, let's see what I can get bit by. Um, but I really like uh, a few years ago, I, I revised my um, ultralight tackle setups and I, I bought like, you, you guys were talking about building rods um, earlier. And so I bought like five or six new blanks and built myself a bunch of new ultralights and got a little a bunch of little Shimano 500 size reels. I really like the 500 size reel for ultralight fishing because they're, the gear ratios on them are really slow. Mm -hmm. And that forces you to slow down and forces you to fish at the most appropriate speeds for the size of the fish you're catching. And so I, I just totally revamped this lineup and... I've always been like a big plastics guy and mm -hmm. I love fishing for small fish on plastics. It's so much fun. And with some of my rods, I can take those two inch crappie tubes and stuff like that and fish them weightless. And it's just, it's, it's a blast. You know, you can rig stuff weedless and fish it around weed beds. And this is like the best kind of fishing to do. If you just like, it's six o'clock sunsets at seven you want to run out, go down the street, and, you know, in summertime, a little wet waiting. I just want to go catch a few fish. Just walk into the water with your sandals on, flip it around, catch yourself a, a, a half dozen uh, sunfish. And then then um, as it starts getting dark, you, you get broken off by like a five-pound bass in the weeds. <laughs> and then you catch, catch a couple of crappies just as it's getting dark. And, and, you know, life is good. 
So it's just like, it's just a really fun way to fish. And then all through the winter time, you know, it's like I could fish hard and I could go out and, and catch a, a couple large mouth bass. Or I could go and, you know, I, I have a lot of 30 to 60 fish days in the winter time because I'm targeting panfish. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going out and racking up the yellow perch, the crappies, the white perch. Um, and I will typically catch more largemouth bass when I'm fishing for for um, perch than I will when I'm fishing for largemouth bass. And, you know, part of it is that when you're fishing for a perch and stuff like that, you're fishing around schools of fish, right? And you're presenting small baits around those schools of fish. Those bass are often cruising those schools of fish without really actively feeding or chasing them. And now this tiny little jig is just sitting there. Maybe you're fishing a, a, a two inch crappie jig on a bobber and it's just sitting in their face and they weren't planning on feeding, but it, it sat in their face just that little one second too long. And now you're, you're bobber down and you got a three pound bass on your ultra line. And it's like a couple you know, of it's just on like the, on the table. Yeah, it's like, picking yeah, up exactly. Yeah. It's just these little <laughs> snacks. I mean, Everybody who's ice fish, you know, they'll, they everybody's got the story of of how they got their biggest bass ice fishing, and and almost for almost no one it was on a shiner. Like everybody will say, oh yeah, no, I was jigging uh, a couple of mousies on a a sunfish jig, and 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 this giant bass came along and ate it. I mean, I got a I got a tiger muskie on a on a jig jigging for sunfish at, at Spy Pond in Arlington a while back. <laughs> you know, it was like 15 years ago. And the irony of that was that he also had my jig in his mouth from the week before. No way. Yes. So That's I got incredible. my other jig back. <laughs> and, you know, this is, it wasn't a big fish, but, you know, it, it's, it's on a, a, a jig smaller than your thumbnail. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, I've also, like, like many of us, have caught five pound bass on, on the, those same little jigs and two pound test, you know. And so it's those, those bass are always around when you're jigging for sunfish. And that's um, just a riot catching a five pound bass on two pound test. You're catching something that's what, um, 250% of what Yeah, exactly. You're, you know, all you of know? a sudden you get smoked. That's catching, <laughs> right. That's catching a 50 pound bass on 20 pound mono. Right? Yeah. Yep. All and right. And good. Car carp are the other ones that do that to you. Like yeah. you, you'll be catching, you know, you set the hook on a white perch and then the next fish you set the hook on, you'd be like, that's not a white perch. This feels like a striper. <laughs> and you're like, well, but there's no stripers here. And it's a, it's a 10 pound carp. They, they'll they hit crappie jigs. They'll hit blade baits. They'll hit all kinds of little jigs. Just You're just not, not going to catch very many of them on it. It's, it's difficult to target a carp on a jig. But if you take a two inch crappie jig, and you take your kayak and you just drift through a school of carp and you do nothing with that jig. Um, if the fish are thick enough, there may be one fish in that school of 200 fish that's willing to just suck it in for a second. If you hit the solo luna table, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you hit that peak feeding window. <laughs> so we talked about the small fish success that you had and the way you've changed your gear and fishing ultra light. That was a great point about that smaller reel that forces you to slow down for those smaller fish. That, that was a really great piece of advice. All right, now let's swap over. All right. What are you doing when you're targeting big fish, big stripers in particular, anything you'd like to share, things that you look for or, or how you prepare yourself for that day? Yeah. You know what? It's, it's like, you really have to get a feel for when your window is. Yeah. And I have this one rod that's just like, it's it's just my hammer rod. You know, it's just like, it's it's a, a custom rod geeks. It's a, a 735, which is like the, a really heavy, beefy rod. And um, I fish it with a, uh, a, a Tranx 400 on it with 50 pound braid. Mm -hmm. And I'll either cast a a 13 inch jig and hoagie with a half ounce head or a 14 inch unweighted just depends on um, like the, the conditions, how deep I'm fishing. But that's like my go-to I'm in the zone tonight. You know, it's, it's the new moon. I'm, I'm going to be fishing through the, the prime of the tide. 
you know, the, the tide's starting to slack out. So, you know, an hour before the tide change to an hour after the tide change, that is just like the most beautiful zone known to striped bass fishermen. It's like you just, you hit that point and you you just know it. Like, you know, it's going to happen. You've been working some fish. Maybe they haven't been biting and now all of a sudden they start biting and they bite all the way down to the, the, the slack of the tide. And then they stop and hopefully everybody else on the spot leaves because the fish have stopped. And you would think that by now that most people would understand that when the people understand when the tide stops, it, it also starts again. Yeah. And, and that, that start up of the tide again is, is that second window that, that occurs. And, you know, sometimes they, they only bite on one side of the tide, but man, most of the time you just have those opportunities and you got to fish through that dead, dead period of the low tide. I just can't tell you how many times I've, I've gotten bit on slack tide when you're catching fish, you're getting bit all along. Maybe the fish are a little bit smaller. That tide slacks out. The bite really stops. Now you've gone 30 minutes without a hit and you're still seeing a few fish here and there. And then all of a sudden you just get that thump and you're like, that is not the same fish that I was getting bit by earlier. And it's just that one little window of, the big fat fish have moved in. They're more willing to feed. They have to. They can expend less effort because there's there's no current, and they just own that that period. And and a lot of times those little fish would just get out of their way. So I, I really like I I'll zone into like certain periods of the night where I just really feel like I'm I, I have the opportunity to catch that that big fish. And then there's, there's other times when you're on the hunt for big fish where you're like, okay, I'm coming up on a spot and you just like, if you're largemouth bass fishing and you come up to a, a lily pad field, you don't just go cruising right up into the middle of the lily pads. You work the edge and you work your way into it. And you do the same thing with like your spot. You know, the edge of the boulder field, you start working into it because you don't know where those fish are going to be. If you go plowing into that, you might blow up that whole school and, and that's it. You, you know, maybe you were only going to catch too. one fish that night. Yeah. So, you know, you, you start working your way into it and you just get, you know, deeper and deeper into the structure and you just, just keep working. And, and, you know, part of it's just believing that it's going to happen. Yeah, 100%. You know, especially if you're you're working through a night where you're just not getting bit a lot. You just have to know that, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. It's just a slow night. You don't make excuses. You just keep fishing. And, you know, it might take you an hour to get, get, get a bite in that spot. But, you know, and the other thing is you don't know if you fish through the hour that they weren't biting. Or, you know, you were just doing the wrong thing. Right. <laughs> so I will often just, you know, I'll, I'll take few, a few casts with one rod, I'll rack it. I'll take a few more casts with another rod, I'll rack that and switch back. I mean, I, I have a pretty good feeling of, about, you know, what I'm going to catch them on. Yeah. I have a lot of confidence in the baits I throw. So my, my calculus is it more in size and re retrieve. So do I dial it back? Like if there, when there was, was a lot of pogies around this summer, I was breaking out the white. I was going down to a 10 inch bait a little more often than I usually do. Um, but when those pogies weren't there, I'm just like, I'm with the dark colors and the biggest baits. Mm -hmm. trying, so, to, trying to mimic those lobster on those big fish, those 14 inch. Yeah. The just, slappy, the slappy eel, right? Yep. The slappy jig and eel. <laughs> didn't it's, they just continue that for a minute and then i was like for a minute yeah then you were like absolutely that's not happening <laughs> yeah and fortunately um you know plastic nation rallied around it and um and and made them bring them back um you know there were there was a time where you, it was really difficult to get any big plastics and mm -hmm. and you know, Hoagie came along and, and started making all these, these great big plastics. And and uh, then, you know, over the last 
So 15 years, there's been a lot more companies that have, have come up with, with big plastics. And, and I think with the, with more companies making big plastics, more people have realized like how effective they really are. You know, I, it, it wasn't exactly a secret, but I think a lot of people have just been afraid to try baits that big. Um, you know, I, I grew up on smaller baits in California and, and we had a lot of small bait fish. So I, I did not like jump right into the, the big baits when I moved here. I was catching a lot of, a lot of bass on like uh, six inch baits. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I, I started fishing the, the nine inch baits and like, you know, like 95, 96, I started fishing a lot of the, the, the nine inch baits. And then I, I'm realizing, man, they're just gulping these nine inch baits. They're not big enough. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just like the, that I, I need a bigger and bigger bait all the time. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I remember back in the day when we keep some big fish, and you know, my customers would keep them, we'd fillet them, or when I worked on the party boats, and like I've seen whole flounders, keeper size flounders and stripers. I've seen big lobsters, uh, a bushel of crabs. You know, uh, like I had one that had six pogies in it once. You know, wow. so yeah, it was absolutely stuff. I had one actually, Dan, you caught it, I think. That one that had like. 30 something whiting oh, in yeah, its it stomach. Was full of whiting. Full of whiting. Yeah, it was early in the season. That was like a, a Memorial Day fish. Yeah, well, I mean, just think about these fish when they get bigger. I mean, anything over 30 inches, really, like the the diameter of the mouth is probably at least six inches fully wide open. Like yeah. they, can, they can definitely swallow. I mean, they swallow in these things whole, too. They're just. Uh, so. To your point, like the the bigger plastics. I mean, what's the biggest plastic you've thrown, Eric? Oh, well, Hoagie used to have a a uh, eighteen inch bait. Oh, that's I just to... showing off now, Eric. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, but I used to get bit on that. Like that was that was a good bait. But um, the, a bait that big is kind of tough in that that um, <clears throat> you know I, I like to fish them on jig heads, and with that much weight, it doesn't stay on the jig head as well. That was a better bait to be fished weightless. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but that I was actually, like fishing a tube and worm. That, that yeah, big of a pretty bait. much, right? Yeah, I like yeah. to fish the sluggos a lot, and for a long time, it was like three eighths and half ounce jig heads. Um, they would get, like at the time. At times, they give a great presentation, but I do like the um, the screw in the owner beast hooks, the weighted mm-hmm. ones, um, or even unweighted if you want to throw unweighted. I feel like it changes the presentation just a little tiny bit. Uh, they're it not totally does. diving down. It's more of a lateral um, type pattern. And um, it can be effective, but to like what we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, you know, having multiple rigs set up to kind of see what's working. What I was getting at though is like having, you know, trying to figure out which bait is actually going to be the one that works. You know, changing your presentation: are you ripping the bait in? Are you bringing it in slow? How how far to the bottom are you going to go? Uh, what's your water depth? All of these things uh, you can you consider. And um, the for me, I use the tactical angle eclipse. Uh, rather than having a million rods rigged up, you can easily switch out baits. I really doesn't. I don't feel like it affects the presentation very much using the clips. Uh, but I do think it's funny how I'll have a whole box full of stuff, and my stuff will be. I'm a, I try to stay very organized with it, with everything. But by the time I'm back to the dock, I have like 30 baits on top of my console. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until you, you find know, the one that gets them. <laughs> I kind of think that that's one of the advantages of the kayak is that. I can't like have 30 baits out, right? So I have to like call mine down to just a few baits and then I have to fish them well. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's just that, that challenge of, okay, so you're probably only going to fish maybe five or six baits tonight. Which ones are you going to use? Which ones are you going to start with and which are going to be your backup? Because what I'll do is I'll, I'll have all my rods rigged and then I'll put that my Hobie has some hand wells along the side. So I'll put a few plastics in there. And so that way, if something gets ripped off or if I just want to change baits, I've got a quick one. I just reach down, grab it, tie it on. Good to go. And so I think sometimes fewer choices are better. We've become, we, we live in a world with a million choices and sometimes it's, it's just, we're better off limiting our choices and, forcing ourselves to just like commit make this one work and that can also you know that 
it can backfire on you. Yeah. So you go out and you're like, oh, I fished this bait as hard as I could. And then you run into your buddy an hour later and, you, and you're like, oh, I got one fish. And they're like, yeah, I got eight of them. Right. Like, okay, what are you using? He's like, oh, yeah, I, I put on the three-quarter ounce. It's like, oh, I've been dragging around weightless the whole night. And then you put on that three-quarter ounce and you're on. And you're like, ah, oh, I just, yeah. you know, it's it's like the failure to adapt sometimes is it kills you. Well, that's and the then, worst part. That's the thing that kills yeah. me. That's all of like at the end of the day, I'm like, if I did something that and it didn't have a great day, it wasn't what I expected. It's like, all right, what did I fail at? What didn't I do? What didn't I recognize? Yeah. You know? And it's part of the learning process, as right, frustrating but, as it is, but that's what keeps you going. Yeah, you, but that's you, also a function of, like, you're on the water all the time. Yeah. So yeah. you're on the water for a lot of really bad days for fishing. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, no and, matter what, you got to produce, right? Yeah, and, and, and no, you, you, you're forced to produce as a guide, but, like, you have a bar of what a good day of fishing is, and there are some days where you, you just can't hit that bar. Just yeah. because the conditions will not let you. And clients don't always understand that. People who fish a lot get it. They they get that one day you're going to go out and you're going to catch 60 fish. And then a couple days later, you're going to go out in similar conditions, but you're going to catch seven. Yeah. And those clients are going to be like, oh, my buddy went out and caught 60. And you're like, well, you know, <laughs> they went out on the right day. You should have gone with them. We... Um... <laughs> So I was talking to you earlier, and people here know I'm also a school teacher, and I teach math. And uh, one of the things that we do is relative probability when I was teaching eighth grade. So I'll start off my lesson. And all the kids know I fish. You know, they try to keep me off topic half the time. And uh, I'll say, all right, guys, let's say I go out fishing, and you're in the docks, and I come back, and you say, how'd you do? And I said, oh, I don't know. I caught five fish. Is that a good day or a bad day? And they're like, well, I don't know. I don't know anything about fishing. I'm like, yeah, right. What do you compare it to? They're like, well, did somebody else go? All right, good. Now we're getting somewhere. Relative frequency, right? All right. If I caught five fish, but Dan over here caught 20, then I had a bad day, you know, because he figured something out. On, on the same conditions, he caught 20, I caught five. But what if I come back the next day? That's and I typically how it goes, by the way. I was just kidding. <laughs> I was waiting for my joke on the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so if I catch five and I come back and Dan's got one, I look like a hero, right? It's all relative to what the conditions are giving you and how you're, and how you're um, doing according to those conditions. So, you know, I'm always challenging myself against myself every day. Yeah. And then if you, uh, if you graph those over the season, like the, the number of fish per day, you're going to find that you get that curve. Yo, yep. Yeah, it's gonna it's yeah. gonna have some skew to it because uh, you, you're not allowed to catch less than zero fish. But um, <laughs> you know but what? I they changed it to one slot fish a day because of this guy yeah. right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've actually been really proud of the last few years. A lot of my regular customers were throwing a lot back. It's been great. It's been great. That's good. So I'm really pumped about that. I'm really trying even more as I grow as a guide and as a fisherman. You know, I think as a young charterman charter captain coming off from a party boat where I was mating for six, seven years. And, you know, it wasn't a good day unless we caught a million caught and haddock, you know? So I think as a young striper guy, you know, and a lot of the people I were getting were clients from those party boats at first, where it was like, fill the cooler. And then just, you know, we had a couple down years. I think it was 2014 was our slow year. And then they switched the regs. And now it's, it's like the majority of my trips have been catch and release. And it's been, it's been awesome. And I think this new slot limit seems to be working. I feel like our, our chunk of fish, like last year, I mean, every day you could go out and no matter what, it seems like you could catch 25, 30 fish on a four-hour trip. You know, enough keeper-sized fish to fill a cooler if you wanted to, enough to release, you know, an over or two. And then all the 20 to 26-inch fish in the world. You know, and see, I didn't like see as many trip. of the smaller fish down my way this year. I didn't see a I lot of the really small that. ones. We saw most of the ones we saw in the smaller size early in the season were probably like 23 to 25. But the majority yeah. of the fish that we do see, actually, Eric, um, because we are live bait fishing and we are kind of going in more areas where we're trying to get, you know, keeper size fish. I would say the majority of the schoolies I catch once the season starts kicking off are, um, you know, around that 25 to plus inch range. Um, 
but the micro bass, the real small ones, like the those days where we used to catch 200, 300 little schoolies in a couple hours and like just have a blast. Um, we might get a day or two like that right now, but we're not getting like the two and a half weeks of that. You know, yeah. so that is a little concerning. Uh, but we've also caught a bunch of real small stripers, like seven inches, which wow. I don't know if they're. I don't know if they're more local around here because I have a hard time imagining those guys are uh, traveling up from the Hudson at the Chesapeake being that. Yeah, small. I've, I've never caught one that small around here. Yeah, um, real tiny. But, they say yeah, the Merrimack a is a small whole over population, and but we actually know Ben Cahagan from the Marine Div- Division of Marine Fisheries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're having him on a podcast in a couple of weeks, and he, we were emailing back and forth today. And he's got a couple of striper studies that he's going to talk to us about in terms of their migration patterns and, and things like that. So I, I really can't wait for that. That will be uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, I think he's done a lot of work on, on stripers in their, like, um, kind of their locational studies and and, uh, and how they go from deeper and shallower water and, you know, day part type stuff and um, a lot of tracking of tagged fish, right? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm pumped. Yeah, yeah. So he'll have some really interesting studies there. I love that stuff. Oh, the light level stuff and the daily migrations. Yeah. I can get into it all day. Yeah. And um, yeah, the daily migrations, like you, like you said, we started off the podcast talking about finding fish, and you know we're looking for a structure adjacent to deep water and flats and and other types of structures. And being adjacent to that deep water not only um, is good for the tidal flow, but it's good for temperature change, light levels, that sun gets up higher, and now they just have a quick drop-off. They don't have to travel far to, um, to get into a situation that's comfortable for them, you know, getting into yeah. their home. I thought of something when you were talking about their food supply chain, right, how they kind of have their, their, their way that they want to go to eat you know, their places that they hit. It's almost like living in a city and like you go to the market basket that's down the street from you, right? You don't go to the one across town, right? Unless mm-hmm. there's any yeah. like, situation. I thought that was, I thought, I don't know, that's how I kind of envision these stripers are going shopping at their local market basket on a typical day. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a while back I read a, uh, a, a study uh, and it was, it was on pond sunfish and the older, more mature fish um, had more places that they would go for feeding. And they were really in tune with the cycle of the hatches of um, like the Daphnia and the little tiny water bugs that they, they feed on so much. And the older fish just had had um, a different pattern th- than the younger fish did. And they just, they created more access to food and more access to high quality food um, by moving from area to area and they would show up in areas where there would be a bloom of food for them and they would get there like before it happened so that they were in the zone to feed when it happened. Oh so it was, God, it was so a really cool. interesting study. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Wow. Yeah. And it's like, um, I know like the shad fishermen, they have the shad bush that bloom, the for Cynthia, mm-hmm. I think it's for Cynthia. My parents have a crab apple tree in the back, and uh, like you know, I can put my boat in the water and go try to catch a, the first couple schoolies of the year every year. You know what, Eric? It doesn't happen until that damn tree blo- starts blooming out a little bit. Because then my dad will call me; he'll be like, "Hey, it's starting to bud. You know, get the boat ready." Yeah, so that like clockwork every year. Yeah, so it's, it's funny how they know. So I got a question for you, right? When you throw in these big, these big hoagies and you build custom rods, first of all, how do you like that Trinks 400? I just bought a 300 for this year. I'm really excited. Uh, I, I like it a lot. Um, I'm someone who, like, I really trash reels because I want a reel to not break and mm-hmm. I don't want to have to take care of it, which are kind of, you know, those are polar opposites. <laughs> if you don't take <laughs> care of a reel, it will break. Um but the Tranks is really the first bait casting reel that I bought that lasted me for more than a season. And I've had them last for, for you know, I've, I've got some Tranks that have lasted for like three or four seasons. And that's just absolutely epic for me. You know, one, it's, it makes the reels a lot cheaper for me. I don't have to buy a new one every year. Right. Um, 
but they they the big thing I like about them is is their drag systems really hold up and they they it's just a tough reel and and it it handles you know kayaks are not kind to reels they, they're going to get dunked they're going to get a lot of salt water in them and you know you, you just you go through a lot of reels and the the tranks has been um, do you go lefty that, or righty on it i am so right-handed i can't i can't yeah. do it like you know I, I know that the hip thing to do is to to reel with your opposite hand but I'm just like I'm phys- I'm not physically gifted enough to to use my left hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know I I, I can do it on this spinny reel. I just can't with a oh. uh, a bait caster. Yeah, I, oh. I bought mine as a lefty because I'm going to use it more for uh, vertical jigging for strikers yeah. than anything. I built a real light light rod, and um, but then you know I ended up I ended up getting <laughs> um, a typical conventional rod too because you know you have to. Um, so I'm debating when I get another reel for that one if I'm going to stick with the left hand. Because when I was jigging, uh, I was using a lot of jigging spoons last year. And very and very effectively, they were, they were great. They were a lot of fun. But I was fishing, you know, your typical conventional reels on the right-hand side. And the ergonomics of, uh, you know, coming over, flipping the lever, dropping line out, switching hands on the bite to get tight on it. I felt like we lost a lot of fish kind of like because we'd be hitting them on the drop and people would be jigging them under their armpit and then they would come down. They wouldn't be able to line tight. Mm-hmm. So I got the lefty trink. So it was there ready to go. And uh, I've, I've actually been practicing just to make myself feel normal with it. And it seems to be working so much. I'm almost thinking, man, if I got one with like a paddle handle for p- casting plugs and stuff, do I still want to go lefty or do I stick with my righty like I'm used to it? I'm not really sure. I'm kind of like up to debate for that. I don't know. I think I'm I'm definitely a left-handed reeler, you know. So I don't just being able to do all the one action on one side, clicking the button, throwing the bait, reeling in, not having to switch hands. That, that I think that's that's just what works for me. Yeah, I, I think if it was natural some... enough for me, I would I would do it. Yeah, but it's just, it's not it's never going to be natural for me just because I'm <laughs> so uh, any tips such for a guy that hasn't thrown a bait caster in about twenty years? <laughs> I just go out and do it. Yeah, um, but um, do it before the season starts and spool it up with mono for your first uh, your first time. You must have a spool of, a big old spool, spool spool of mono somewhere in the basement. <laughs> that uh, you can you can spool up the reel a few times and uh, just strip it off when when you've ruined the line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, do you use the magnetic assist at all, or do you do you have it off primarily? Um, I I just stick it on a really low setting. Um, yeah. I like magnets much better than mechanical braking systems. Mm-hmm. Um, in general, magnets are just just better because like the lows are much easier to deal with than than. Like a, a low on a magnet is a much more free spool than a low on a mechanical uh, braking mm-hmm. system with the, the little rollers in there because there's they're creating their own friction where that when you have the magnets you can really reduce that that friction level. Um, you know I, I'm very well versed in in conventionals. You know I've I've been using conventionals longer than you guys have been alive. So <laughs> uh, you know it's just like it's it's second nature to me. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in the the early seventies getting backlashes and picking them out, and uh, by the eighties I was I was reasonably proficient. So, you know, I've had thirty years of progress since I became reasonably pr- proficient. <laughs> and I I use a lot more spinning reels than I ever did before. And the big thing is with spinning reels is like when I was a kid, spinning reels were horrible. Yeah, they, they were just they like then, yeah. yeah. I mean, you you. Would lucky you were lucky to get a season out of a spinning reel before it rusted out, the the bale spring broke, you name it. You know, thirty things would go wrong with it, and the handle would rust off. And now they're much better. And braided line also fishes really well on on spinning reels, especially light ones. Um, I like the for bait casters. I like to use a little bit heavier line on them. It just I feel like I, I can. Um, work with it better and also once you need bifocals um you don't want to backlash <laughs> with with anything that's too small so, so for, for your spinning rods when you're fishing these huge when, you, when you're fishing these huge hoagies these 14 inch hoagies and with jig heads 
what kind of rods are you building for yourself? Like, what blanks do you like for that kind of that kind of uh, lore you're tossing? I like the Rod Geeks rods. I have a 734 spinner that I use. Um, yeah. I'm not big on on um, using the spinners with heavy baits. I'd much rather use the spinners with the weightless, and yeah. then use the the jig heads on my my conventionals. I just feel like I'm more comfortable using more weight on the conventionals and, uh, you know, just that, that heavier weight on the spinning. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with a conventional reel, just yeah. holding onto it because that's been, you know, 75% of, of my fishing, um, and probably 90% of my fishing with line heavier than 20 pound test. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I don't use a, a ton of spinning reels for big fish, but um, I had a bike accident um, like six or seven years ago. And after I had that bike accident, I bought a couple spinning reels and rods for specifically for stripers to force myself to change back and forth between a conventional and a spinning so that, you know, we're talking about handedness. Yeah. Like that was my way of switching hands and, like yeah. as you get older, if you want to protect those shoulders, it's it's a good way to uh, to even out the load. So that's mostly why I, I use spinning now is because it's a good way for me to even out the load. Yep. So you're not working yourself too hard. Yeah. Love it. Now the Do majority of your saltwater fishing, are you fishing in your home waters there in front of Boston, or are you pretty? Um, you, do you travel a bit? Like, I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty road? mobile in in you know in in the the greater Boston area. And I use, I use a really generous description of the word Boston. Yeah. So like think of Boston as, um, let's say the, the East end of the canal to, um, to just North of the Merrimack. Yeah. So when there I say, <laughs> when I say I fish Boston Harbor, I'm fishing in that area. Yeah. <laughs> so you're fishing I love it. The whole coast of Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's that's as specific as I'm willing to be, you know. But, yeah, yeah, um, sure. Because you know, the, I may fish one area one night and be like, "Oh, that sucked," and now I'm 30 miles away the next night. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's it's just like, you know, you're looking for the bite, and then when you do find the bite, it's not not like you want to call a million people in on it. So. No. Yeah. So you were saying that you came from California. When did you come out this way? I moved, uh, yeah, I moved here in, in 94. 94. So, and you've been fishing here since, I assume. I've been fishing here since. Um, I only caught stripers once before I, I moved here. And I uh, went to, you know, the local tackle shop here, Arlington Bait and Tackle, and went in and talked to the guy. I'm like, yeah, what do I do to catch a striper? He told me where to go, so I went out and, Okay, here's where you catch stripers. So I cast out and I, I caught some stripers. I was like, okay, this is actually kind of cool. And it took me a little while to realize like what a great artificial fish that they were. Um, you know, I started off doing some bait fishing just because that's that's where people were directing me. And uh, I had been using sluggos a lot in California. And like the first time I went down to the canal, I was like. Oh man, this this is the place to use my sluggos, and and then I went up to the Merrimack and and the the nineties uh, the beachfront in the Merrimack with a sluggo on a one ounce jig head, which you just cast it out and hung on, and you know there were those sixty to eighty fish days on on a really regular basis. Yeah, nothing big, but man, the, that river was just it was an ocean of fish. There's a lot of life there, man. I don't think people realize how many fish kick around that little habitat. Oh man, it was it was ridiculous. Still, the sluggos are still kicking. That's probably our number one overall bait that we toss up here: soft plastics like sluggos, hoagies, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it's just really easy. You know, it's yeah. it's it's a really Personal. effective way, and it's a way to to you know one thing that that a lot of people don't do is like. They think of fishing in two dimensions, like I'm going to go cast by those lily pads. I'm going to cast next to those rocks mm -hmm. where you really need to think in three dimensions is I'm going to cast next to those rocks where it's 17 feet deep and I'm going to sink it down to about 15 feet and I'm going to keep it in that strike zone of within three to four feet of the bottom all the way back. 
it's a three dimensional thing. It's not it's not left, right, forward, back. It's you know out and down, and yeah, then we, working with the swing. Absolutely. And, when you were talking about the um, you know basically like what what weight uh, jig head is working. Like, that's actually what I was thinking about. I was like, you know, you can have two guys fishing with the same exact thing, but, you know, depending on the retrieve and where they're actually putting it in the water, uh, that's going to be the difference between someone getting 10 fish and someone getting nothing at all. Yep. Yeah, and it's just crazy, too. Like, and then at the same time, like, you know, if I get four people casting sluggos on jig heads out, you know, there'll be two guys that kind of know what they're doing. One guy that's, you know, figuring it out as it goes. And then one person who has no idea. And the guy who has no idea, you know, sometimes he catches just as well as everyone else, too. He might just be reeling in too slow and it's hanging on that bottom. And, you know, it ends up working. Yeah. And that's one of the other things. It's like our preconceived notions about um, how to fish often get in the way of our own success. 100%. Like, here's how you retrieve this lure. It's like, well, that's one of the ways you retrieve that that lure. Um, you know, watch the seven year old kid next to you. You know, it, it, if you could see what he's doing, he just he just stuck three fish in a row while you caught one. Is there right. a reason for that, or is it just randomness? Because some of it's just randomness. Yeah, it's nice. And, <laughs> and other things is just like, you know what? He was just pausing a little bit longer, and he was getting it down a little deeper. Or he was struggling with the reel and didn't really know how to reel it fast enough. And because it was just kind of tumbling on the bottom, those bass were just, they were feeding down and they were all over it. You know, so they, you don't always understand the reason for someone's success, but um, you, you pay attention can't, to it. Yeah, you can't say this is the only way to work something. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, only, I guess only one thing holds true. You're, if you're not fishing, you're not catching fish. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. How many days on the water? Did you are you like a three hundred days on the water kind of person? No. I, I have I have kids and family, so um you know, I'll, I'll probably no. fish <laughs> so over a hundred days. Yeah. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. Oh, I'll, sorry, I'll be well, over a hundred days. Hundred? That's and, solid. Yeah. <laughs> and and some some of those uh you know, I might get up to like one twenty, one thirty with vacation and um like if you count all the little, oh, I drove down the street and I went and caught, you know, a dozen sunfish or, um, you know, my kid was playing a sport and I found a pond next to there where they were playing and I, I went out and took a few casts and caught some fish. Um, you know, I, I was, my kids are, are in high school now, but when they were going around playing soccer and, and all this other stuff, uh, there were always places to go take a cast. Uh, one of my kids was playing football, um, like flag football along the Charles River. <laughs> and, you know, the, the Charles River is a fish place with water in it. And it's just like if you like to catch fish, even if if you, you know, it's, it's a place you might not catch a ton of big ones. But if you just like to go out and catch fish, just throw little jigs and you will catch fish. And I would just go, and, and while he was warming up, I had like 20 minutes to fish. So I'd go out, and I'd catch a handful of fish, and, you know, maybe just perch and sunfish, whatever. Might catch a bass. And, you know, I got a little fix in. So that, that counts as one of my days of fishing. Love it. So, yeah, well, just like fit, fit it in when you can. I call it a, a, a jog fish, and that's, that's like you tell your wife, I'm just going out for a jog. <laughs> and you could get away with that right you just right. go out and, and spend like 30 minutes going for a run well what if you went 30 minutes and you went down down the street and took a few casts and then came back that's that's your run that's your jog fish so try that one out you're gonna have to yeah definitely <laughs> i have two young daughters five and three so it's uh yeah the, the days on the water it's not as easy as it once was Right. And a lot of that, when the, the kids are little, um, it, it really, that's why I, I did a lot of night fishing and a lot of those little quick trips of, you know what, I've got an hour. Where am I going to go in this one hour? 
Yeah, my wife's been great. Uh, we kind of uh, during the season developed the cadence of at least I'll have I can go like five a.m. to eight thirty a.m. Go before work, and then yeah. you know that's that's my fix for the day. Um, you know, but the cool thing is too is like do you, do your do your kids like the, any of them like to fish with you? Have they picked it up? They haven't really picked it up. Yeah, to me, they, to they, them, they I'm just eventually. the guy. Who, just the guy who fishes. All right. <laughs> Yeah, Some of their oldest... friends are like, why don't you, you don't go fishing with him? I can't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good. I don't know. I, I kind of relate that to uh, like hunting with my father. Like I did it a, when I was a kid and then I stopped for a while and then I just found it again, you know, and now it's something we bond over and it was yeah. a solid, like, like I would say like 13 year gap um, and going back. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose hope. But my daughter, the five five year old, like expresses a huge interest in fishing. She loves it. That's um, awesome. And I'm sure that the second one is probably going to like it even more than her. Yeah. Uh, because now they've grown up on going on the boat. You know, they, it's all they really know and, and can remember. Emma's going to uh, be the one in the Grundens chunking bait up. I could yeah, see it. In the exa- future. Yeah, exactly. Charlie, Charlie will be the one up in the bow, like tackle. Emma yeah. will be the bait fisherman. Yeah. I can just see it's their personality, you know? <laughs> yeah, Charlie will end up like a fly fisherman, and then Emma will be like, yeah, where are the mackerel at? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, they're taking them to the boat show this weekend, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it'll it's be, fun. be fun. So, All right, Eric. We're about an hour and a half here. I could talk to you all night, brother. Yeah. This was fantastic. Uh, learned a lot. Really awesome. interesting. Your, your take, your... The, the way you talk about the fishing, the passion you have behind it, the knowledge, uh, the time you put in, um, this was this was fantastic. Uh, this was really great. We really pre- appreciate you coming out. Yeah, Eric, great. I really I really appreciate you know sharing your perspective um, as such an experienced kayak fisherman. It's nice to hear um, you know the things that you're looking for. It's very similar to the a lot of what we're doing too. It's just two different platforms, and um, you just can get into some skinnier water. Yep. Fishing is fishing. Fish is yeah, fish. Fish is Just fish. Like we yeah. talked about earlier. Awesome. Yep, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, Eric. Well, everybody, thank you for listening to Miles and the Merrimack. Um, if you want to get some more podcasts or fishing information, blogs, other videos that we do, we're going to have a members only section uh, after this one. So go to milesofthemerrimack.com if you're a member. If you're not a member, sign up and. Uh, we got a lot of things coming down the pipeline. We're going to do an online course uh, on Thursdays in March. And uh, we have our Fisherman's Fair coming up on April 29th in Newburyport. So really excited for that one. We've got a lot of great vendors coming out and a lot of tackle, both new and used, that you can take a look at. So Excellent. All right. Thanks again, Eric. Appreciate it. And don't right. sign off. Thanks, just, guys. Don't sign Thank off you. just yet because when I stop the recording, it's going to take just a minute to upload, okay? Awesome. All right. Thanks again, pal.